Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance at, at your lotus feet. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharajas. Whenever you're ready, Maharaj, you may go ahead and take the call, the call over. Today you'll be kindly preaching us from 10 to 5, chapter 10, verse 3. Hari Bol. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurvena Maha Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamri Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaur Vani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa, Tarubis Jakri, Basindu, Pei, Bachapatita, Nam, Pavane, Bio, Vaishnave, Bio, Namahong, Namaha, Jaisi Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Srivasadi Gaur, Bhakti Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 10th Chapter, verse number 3. Uh, we go right to the translation. This is a continuation of this particular pastime. The Jad Bharat and Maharaj Shrugana. Translation, when the palaquin carriers heard the threatening words of Maharaj Rahugana, they became very afraid of his punishment and began to speak to him as follows. Srila Prabhupada's purport, according to political science, a king sometimes tries to pacify his subordinates, sometimes chastises them, sometimes divides them, and sometimes rewards them. In, the way, in this way, the king rules his subordinates. The bearers of the palaquin could understand that the king was angry and that he would chastise them. So, uh, Jad Bharat is the focus here and that he has uh, been forcibly taken to be a palaquin carrier for this king, King Rahugana. He, this king happens to be going on to a holy place. He's actually going to Kapila Ashram. He's actually in the process of going to a holy ashram. One of his carriers didn't show up or it was lost. So they needed one. So they found Jeb Bart just in an open field and thought he was a deaf and dumb person and brought him to be a carrier. But they didn't know Jeb Bart is a great Brahmana whose consciousness is fixed on seeing the soul in all living entities. And therefore, when he was uh, asked to do this service, he also was very much aware that there were many ants on the ground where he was walking and because of that he would try to avoid the ants and uh, this caused a shaking of the palaquin and therefore the king was getting upset <laughs> um now the king is responding to his disturbances and he's angry and uh, he's directing it towards the bearers who feel like they're going to get chastised unduly because of this other man. So um, here we see a little bit in the purport, Prabhupada speaks about political science. Mm -hmm. Political science means to somehow rule your subordinates by acting in different ways towards them. Um, this is a, a technique for keeping order, 
If you chastise someone all the time, you'll lose them. If you reward, reward them all the time, they'll continue to make mistakes. And so, does both, he even divides them. And this is political science, so we're getting a little understanding here. Now he's ready to chastise. And the Pelican bearers are overwhelmed with fear. He says he's very much afraid, and they don't know what he's going to do. And so they'll scup and try to defend themselves and blame everything on Judd Bart. Which kinds of leads to the the, the folding of this whole pastime where Judd Bart will instruct the king in the reality of existence. The king thinks he's a king, and that is a problem. If we think we're anything that other than who we actually are, that is called insanity. <laughs> We are only one, we only have one identity. The identity has multi definitions to it, but there's only one identity. And that is Jivair Sarupoy Krishnera Nityadas. That is our only identity. We, do, we change material identities life after life. Therefore, whatever material identity we have is lost at the time of death, it's acquired at the time of birth and it's acquired throughout the life. But we only have real one continuous identity, Jivar Sarupai Krishna Ranachidas. We are only one thing, we are the eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is our only identity. Um, we accept material identities for the sake of functioning the material world. And so more like role playing. Uh, as as um, Shakespeare said, the entire world's a stage. <laughs> it's a dramatic stage too. Everyone's playing a role and sometimes, not sometimes, but all the times we play many roles. Uh, if we are a mother, we are also a wife. Sometimes we are also a friend of someone else. We're also a, maybe we also have a job as a teacher. So we play many roles, but these roles are all superfluous to our identity. We have to play the roles in order for us to somehow or go on in life accordingly, but we should be very much aware that we are not the roles we play. Hmm. One senior devotee in our movement was preaching to some, one very nice couple in South America. And uh, they were very respectable, quite opulently situated. And he was telling them, uh, you know, you are a soul. You're actually a spiritual being. You're a soul. And uh, he's trying to help them understand that they were something different than their physical forms. So the lady was listening and she responded, said, oh, yes, I know. I'm a soul, but I'm a female soul. In other words, she identified the gender with the with the uh, spiritual essence. And so gender refers to, of course there is spiritual gender too, but that is not like material gender. Material gender uh, forces us to act in so many different ways. Spiritual gender gives us a position to serve in a certain way. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's very hard for the conditioned soul to get the eye beyond the body conception of life. Even if you're trying to develop that, 
transcendental consciousness or that awareness of one being above the material energy, the entire material world is reinforcing the opposite. Constantly, you're being uh, reinforced with the idea you are this body. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways you can uh, somehow reduce the effects of that is live simply. The body doesn't mean the body does not mean uh, that uh, we have to somehow or other fortify it in so many different ways. Living simply helps us to get beyond the bodily conception of life. That's why simplicity is one of the main principles of devotional life. Simple means, as Krishna mentions, or as the Shastra mentions, to uh, take what you need to keep body and soul together. And that's all. Of course, if you're a householder, you might need a little more to maintain the griha. The griha. But in general, we don't really need much. <laughs> we need... We need some association with others, relationships, association. We need food. And we may need a, we need a dwelling where we can sleep at night. <laughs> like that. And that's pretty much it. Some food, some housing, and some relationships. And whatever else we have, you know, maybe we have some books and clothes but these things can all should be done accordingly especially when it comes to the body to try to decorate the body to try to make it so comfortable um i i just switched my locations about a few days ago so now i'm in a very very more simplified uh life to being in a particular lifestyle for one year, which was quite nice in terms of the facilities I had to do everything I wanted to do. I'm living in a more simplified lifestyle now, and, I, and I'm really enjoying it much better. <laughs> it makes life much more easier to focus on Krishna, and it gives you more time for focusing on Krishna. And it also facilitates more uh, relationships because simple people have a tendency to spend more time with each other and less time alone with all the mechanical gadgets that we have been blessed with by modern society which are another for, uh, forms of addiction people get addicted to their computer to their cell phone especially to their cell phone I think without the cell phone, how is it possible to live? And this is not an exaggeration. I was giving a lecture in Northeastern University, which is in Boston area, many a few years ago, about three years ago. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we were talking about you know the uh, modernization of society and all of the different. Uh, incumbences we have coming with that and then we got directly right into the discussion on cell phones and we were talking about cell phones and at the end of the class one one young man he, he came up to me and he was very distressed looking <laughs> and he said to me he said Swami you know if I don't have my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. <laughs> exact words he said. <laughs> uh, I, I could see it on his face. He wasn't exaggerating. He, he had his, him and his cell phone had come to a very, you know, nice marriage. They looked like they were going to be internally engaged in, you know, associating with each other. And so people get so attached to these material things that they become 
not only part of them, it becomes their own focus in life. So um, living simply, it's not that you shouldn't have a cell phone. I have a cell phone. I have a computer also. But you should live in such a way as to minimize the usages of these things to what is absolutely, practically, barely necessary. And not beyond. Because modern civilization will simply push you for more and more and more. And if you have that desire, you'll be finding yourself encumbered more and more. And then there's not much time for Krishna consciousness. So living simply helps to get beyond all of the uh, difficulties that come with living in the material world. And that uh, facilitates Krishna consciousness nicely. So knowing we are not this body means acting. We just say, well, I know I'm not this body, but we're acting like we are the body. So therefore, Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. One should cultivate knowledge and renunciation side by side. And that way we can make nice advancement in Krishna consciousness. Because this knowledge will free you from the material attachments along with the power of your service. And then the less you have, the more you are happy, actually. And that is a fact. Sometimes we think the more I have, the more I'll be happy. Um, and we we fall into that. And a lot of times we find that even the stuff we have, we don't even use. <laughs> we throw it in the closet. There was a there was a revolution in Africa. Oh, many, 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 a few decades ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago, maybe even farther, maybe back in the 1950s or 60s. Well, one particular king of one African country, his name was Haile Selassie. And he was not, he was kind of a despotic ruler. And uh, he was overthrown, I think he was killed. And his, so they came into his quarters to clean out whatever was there. They went into his wife's area and she, they counted 3,000 pairs of shoes she had. Can you imagine 3,000 pairs of shoes? <laughs> That's 3,000. She wasn't a centipede. She only had two feet. <laughs> But, you know, we somehow or other see how one can get ridiculously enamored by the material energy. One has some extra wealth. They spend it on useless things. I remember I was reading in the, in the newspapers. This was in Chicago. When I was staying in Chicago, I was reading in the newspapers that there was a a type of addiction. You know, we have addiction, people are addicted to uh, drugs, people are addicted to alcohol, people are addicted to eating, people are addicted to sex life. These are all uh, phobias that people have, and there's many more. They actually have clubs and treatments for people who are addicted to different things. But there's another type of addiction that I was just appalled, not appalled, uh, uh, sh shocked to hear about. And it was called Shoppers Anonymous. People who are addicted to shopping. <laughs> now, you would think it would be the rich people, but no, it was people, even ordinary people. They had become so addicted to shopping that they couldn't stop shopping. And sometimes they would go into big debts because they couldn't pay. 
and they would lose, you know, some of their property, be putting put into great difficulties because of just spending money. And people were spending like more money than they were making just on buying things. And it became a, a really. And there was a group that was born at, called uh, shopaholics. They were called shopaholics. It's like we have alcoholics, then you have shopaholics. So I thought, wow, this is really uh, strange. <laughs> but then I could understand from Shastras that this idea of greed, when it's when it's not restricted, it go it, it can extend itself out unlimitedly. There are people who have so much money and still want more. They're not even using all they have, always thinking of getting more. There's people who uh, position in power, never satisfied, they want more. So that's the material world. And then, so therefore, devotee knows that this is all a waste of time, a waste of energy, deviation from Krishna consciousness, better to live simply. Simply as we can and execute Krishna consciousness nicely. It's not that you have to go back to farm life. Of course, we do recommend it in, in many cases. But we should, you know, not be enamored by all the, the uh, things that come our way for purchase. Live all we need is food, relationships, and opportunities for devotional service. Krishna provides these things automatically. We have to work hard for the extra stuff we want. And sometimes we get it, it doesn't make us happy. We lose it, it makes, it makes us unhappy. So yeah, this is material life. So the way I brought this up is that the king could not understand that he will, he is a, a spirit soul. Although he's playing the role of a king, he's enamored by that role. And therefore, he thinks he's the ruler of subjects. So all of the different designations that the living entity material world or even acquires due to their own desires, are all superfluous to our real identity, which is uh, eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is our only identity. When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati <clears throat> uh, asked, he was asked, uh, uh, how many disciples do you have? <clears throat> Because he never identified himself as a spiritual master. He used to say, anyone who says he's a guru is a guru. A guru means, you know, spiritual master. Guru means cow, animal. So what he was saying is that anyone who identifies themselves with the role they play is no better than an animal. <laughs> And when he was asked how many disciples he has, he said, I have four, two arms and two legs. And they carry out my instructions. <laughs> now, he wasn't so much interested in being put in that category of a guru. He was more like seeing himself as, I am serving those persons who come to me in order for them to become Krishna conscious. Therefore, when he was asked another time, how many disciples you have? He said, I have no disciples. They are all my, they are all my teachers. I learn something from each and every one of them. So Prabhupada had that same vision, our spiritual. He was seeing his disciples as representatives of his spiritual master who was sent to him by his spiritual master to assist him 
in his service to his spiritual master. That was Prabhupada's vision of his disciples. He said that. He said, I'm seeing all of you as simply representatives of my spiritual master. He has sent you to help me so I can serve him by spreading Krishna consciousness. So this is proper consciousness. It's not something that is relegated to a few people. Even if we don't have it in, re in realization, we should understand it in theory that we are nothing but this material with the spiritual existence the material existence is simply superfluous to our existence. wife or you know a king <laughs> a servant uh, in some kind of restaurant in other words whatever role we're playing to keep it as it is there was a famous actor his name was john barrymore he was a playwright and he would write his own plays. And then he would also take part in one of the characters in the play. But he was the writer of that particular part that he's playing, but he was always separate from that because he knew, he knew the whole play and he knew he was playing a role. <laughs> Sometimes even in dramatic circles, people get so involved in the roles they play that they actually start to act in that role. And that happened a couple of times in India. I don't remember the exact details, but there was one play where one person actually took the part completely of the person he was playing, which was a bad person, and he killed, <laughs> he killed one of his fellow, you know, actors in the play. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, we do that sometimes. We get so absorbed in our roles that we demand people to recognize us in the role. And you'll see that in this particular pastime. The king is really proud that he's a king and I mean, the pelican bearers are simply his subordinates. And you'll see, this is a really, really interesting uh, section of the Bhagavatam. It's probably one of the most interesting. We've done plays, drama, dramatic uh, expressions on these sections. This is so interesting. And you'll see how the king is shocked into realizing he's something who he, he He's not something who he thinks he is. <laughs> Judd Bart really enlightens him in transcendental knowledge. It's really quite powerful. And the way he does it, it is so convincing for each and every one of us. Now, this is a very uh, uh, important part of the Bhagavatam because it helps us to understand that whatever identity we have, and we see from this particular in pastime, how Jad Bharat, we actually do one play called The Three Lives of Bart Maharaj. He's Bart Maharaj, the king in the forest. He's Bart Maharaj, the deer, and then Bart Maharaj, Jad Bharat. So you'll see that throughout the Bhagavatam in this area that he's playing the king of the world who retired into the forest, gets attracted by a deer, becomes a deer, and then in his next life becomes a, a Brahmin who simply acts like he is deaf, dumb, has no intelligence, but he's simply playing that role in order not to get bothered by the activities of the material existence. He doesn't want to interact with anyone because he knows it's just an, more of an entanglement. He's simply happy to finish out his life and go back home, back to Godhead, but meditating on the Lord within his, and within his mind and within his heart. Now, this is an interesting section. So I'll stop here, and maybe we can open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. Very nectarian class indeed, very informative. Devotees, if we have any questions, we can ask Maharaja now. Mm -hmm. 
your class has made everybody very sublime, Maharaj. <laughs> it's very wonderful class. I think everybody was absorbing it to the core of their heart. Thanks always for reminding us about our position. Thank you. And it's That's very- That's what Prabhupada, Prabhupada did that all the time. In all his lectures, he's always coming back to the point that you have to understand you, you belong to Krishna eternally. Keeping that foremost in our life, we can go about our activities. <laughs> Very true. And I also learned something new that even the spiritual have a, like a spiritual gender. It's very interesting to know. It's to, in yeah, order have, to serve in Krishna. Yeah, yeah we have gopis, we yeah. have cowherd boys, we have Mother Yasoda. They're all pure of spiritual beings. So in the spiritual world, they're also playing. Because as Prabhupada said, the spiritual world is simply or well, the material world is simply a reflection of the reality. What we live here, mostly in this world, with arrangements, friends, family members, and others, is simply, a, as I said, uh, a mirror reflection of the reality. It looks the same, but the essence and the substance is uh, completely different. So yeah, you know, in the spiritual world, there are there are animals, there are trees, there are plants, there are women, there are men, there are, you know, there are the varieties that we see in this world. Many of it uh, are in the spiritual world also. Right. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your explanation. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your service. Thank you for always giving such a wonderful class. I was very touched by your reminders to live simply um, because it is such a challenge <laughs> to do that in the material when we're living in, you know, environments that are full of, you know, material things. And, um, you know, we're always being, at least in this country, we're always being advertised to, you know, everywhere you go, someone's trying to get you to buy something. So I'm so grateful for that reminder. And, um, and also your class also made me feel very, even more grateful for Bhagavatam because just in listening to you explain, you know, the different pastimes of um, Maharaj Bharat um, just made me, made me excited about the coming um, verses and purports and also made me feel like, you know, we're so fortunate to get this knowledge every morning. Every morning we have this opportunity and it's very rare. Most people don't do not do this. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I'll just make a comment based on what you said is that, and this is a principle that exists um, in the material life taught that in order to live or even to be successful, they give you a whole list of things you need. In spiritual life, you don't need anything. All you need is Krishna. When you have Krishna, you have everything. In material life, if you don't have Krishna, then in order to somehow or other substitute for the absence of Krishna, we surround ourselves with so many things that we think we need. But as soon as we bring Krishna in our lives and everything, there's no need anymore. Everything is provided. Even if you do need something on a material world, when you have Krishna, whether you get it or don't get it, doesn't matter <laughs> because Krishna is there. <laughs> in other words, Krishna, be, connecting with Krishna is so satisfying that what other need is there? <laughs> If we don't have Krishna, then we we have a whole list of things that we think we need. 
this, you know, people make up for their lack of relationship with Krishna by trying to substitute it for the things of this world. It's trying to fortify that need for a loving relationship by with things or even with, you know, positions or even with, you know, some people have a lot of money and they just feel good because they have money. It gives them this false sense of that, you know, I'm, I got something. But if you don't have Krishna, it doesn't matter what else you have. <laughs> Earlier, when you were speaking of speaking of people with lots of money and, and what they're doing, and, the, and now I was thinking of, and yeah, now they're all going to space. You know, they have nothing better to do with their money than to go up into space. You know, these billionaires, and it's it's so sad when you know they could have such an impact on on the on what's happening on this planet, but they spend billions of dollars to fly into space. Yeah, and then when I. Papa talks about that. They don't want to stay there. They want to come back. So what's the use of going? <laughs> he talks about that. Five billion dollars for the space program. That was all. That's years ago. It was five billion dollars. That was about forty years ago, more sixty years ago. And it was just. What did they accomplish? Nothing. We got some rocks. But the rocks are from Arizona anyway. <laughs> so, that was billions and billions of dollars of money was thrown away on some fantasy. Papa said, you can't go to the moon unless you qualify yourself. The moon is a higher planet. You get in there. Not simply by some mechanical device. Mm -hmm. You have to live, you have to have you have to have a body for the atmosphere to live there. And that body comes by way of karma or you know pious activities, because the moon is a heavenly planet. Well, you know, they don't know anything, they just think for some adventure. Use the But we can travel beyond space back to the spiritual world <laughs> simply by the power of one's devotional service. Because according to your activities, you are existing in a particular place within a particular environment. Your desires plant you to where you are and who you are. If you change your desires, you change your activities. You change your activities, you change your any the atmosphere you live in. Or you transform that atmosphere into the same kind of activities you're performing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we look around and see everything around you and everything you have and everything you are. It's simply a, a product of our consciousness. If you want to be different, change your consciousness. <laughs> In order to, to continue to change your consciousness, you have to change your desire. Desire is the foundation for activity, which formulates consciousness. So we desire to serve Krishna, and then for the Krishna will facilitate according to the, the level of our desire. Because the divine desires are not stagnant. They are they motivate us in a certain direction, depending on the quality of that desire. Sometimes you wonder why how people are living the way they're living. It's because of their desire. That's right. You ask them to change their activities, they can't because their desire is in, in the same way as their activities are. That's why when you put people in jail for crimes, 
generally they come out and perform crimes again, even though they get punished in jail and suffer. Why? Because the desire is still there. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for everything that you just said. It was so um, enlivening. And just the way you always put things, I really appreciate that, that our desires plant us where we are. Yes, because our karma is what, you know, our karma ends up, our desires end up as our karma. So thank you so much for that. It's a, yeah, yeah our, our, our particular situation is a reflection of our desires, which is, for, which is pushed by our karma. Our karma pushes our desires in a certain way. So Krishna consciousness is up karma. When you start performing devotional service, you change your consciousness, you change your activities, you change everything. You change the quality of your activities anyway. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept our humble obeisances. Glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for reminding us about simplicity. And also, I was struck by your statement that when we have Krishna, then we really don't need so many things. And uh, simplifying our life actually becomes easier. Um, I also was struck. As you were speaking about a statement made by Sarojini Naidu of Mahatma Gandhi, he was trying to be simple and doing so many things. Of course, uh, a very pious person and all that. But his uh, goal of being simple, living in poverty, she went on to say, you have no idea how much wealth it requires to keep that man in poverty. So that was very significant that... Without Krishna, even if we try for simplicity, it's only going to be another uh, rearrangement of the material energy. I just was thinking about that. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. A really good point. <clears throat> and people who love, try to live simple without Krishna, they just wind up getting involved in more kinds of, other kinds of sense gratification. That's all. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Koti Koti Dhanvat Pranam, Srila Prabhupada Chala Guru Dev Ki Jai, Sisterata Kupinath Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj, for your deep, deep, deep personal association. Koti Koti Dhanvat Pranam, please accept our humble evidences. We have a fall, Bhakti Sangha, Vaishnava. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Rinda Gopika. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I have one question, but it's not, it, it may be related or not related. Can I ask? I have um, a question. I have one, I have one question. Can I ask? It, it may be related or not related with this uh, class. Yeah, sure. So, if a person commits suicide, so what is the destination and how can we redeem? To see well, soul. committing suicide mean, means that you're, you're trying to get rid of your material body, but your material desires don't go with your material body because the material desires are are stuck the subtle body. So the, the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego are the places of the material desires, not the physical body. So getting rid of the physical body leaves you still with material desires, but without a physical body. And therefore, many persons who commit suicide become ghosts. They have a subtle body, but they have no physical body. And therefore, they cannot fulfill their desires. Therefore, they bother other living entities. 
by trying to take over their bodies in order to facilitate their own material desires. So suicide is not a solution. In fact, it just creates a bigger problem. People suffer and they think by getting rid of the body, they can end their suffering. <coughs> that can only happen when you can achieve a spiritual body. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Krishna himself, he was, when he heard that Sanatana Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, he would come and see Sanatana Goswami every day. Sanatana Goswami contracted this, uh, these sores all over his body that were oozing. They were uh, wet sores. And Lord Chaitanya would come up and see Sanatana every day and embrace him. And these sores would touch the body of Lord Chaitanya. And this was making Sanatana Goswami really, really miserable. That he was that Lord Chaitanya's body was being contaminated from the sores on his body. The Lord didn't mind because he he saw beyond all that and saw the he saw the greatness of Sanatana. But Sanatana was thinking, what can I do? And so he decided to commit suicide. And he, the, the Rathiatra was coming up, so he was going to throw himself underneath the Rathiatra cart and end his life. But when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu found out, he became quite upset. <laughs> he said, Sanatan, you know, you cannot destroy this body. This body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. Therefore, you're a thief. You're actually trying to destroy another person's property. Therefore, you should be punished. Uh, what he was saying is that, uh, you know, your body is not, doesn't belong to you. You have dedicated to my service. Therefore, it belongs to me. The Lord was saying that. So our body is meant to be used for the service of the Lord. And then the body has, if it's not being used, or then the body is simply, you know, being used in the wrong way. And when you use something in the wrong way that doesn't belong to you, there's punishment that comes by way of, because the body is given to us. It's not, it's not that, well, I made the body and it belongs to me and I can do what I want with it. Krishna allows you to do it, to use it in the way that you want to, but he also gives you the intelligence how to use it. So those who commit suicide, um, their destination is usually a ghostly body, which is a very miserable type of existence. Miserable in the sense that just like, just say you, you're hungry and you want to eat, but there's no food. Or saying that hungry, want to eat, but you're too sick and you can't eat at all. So there's a kind of a misery there that comes with the desire to want to eat and can't eat. I want to, to others, but I can't. I want to do something, can't. So that's a ghost body. A ghost has the desires, but not the apparatus. Mm -hmm. And so then he has to live out that existence as a ghost body and then come back into another material body again. So suicide is never a solution for any kind of problem. It simply compounds the problem. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have heard, I don't know for authorized per person or author, from the scripture, that uh, if a person commits a suicide, then for seven lifetimes they commit suicide. Is that true? I don't know. Yeah. This I is what I... You mean they've, they've committed it before? Yeah. They like they commit suicide, and then another they take seven births, seven more, no, so many births, but then they also commit suicide for at least for seven even more birth. I'd have to see that Shastra because it doesn't uh, really resonate with any logic. I don't know 
I'd have to I'd have to know where that is in the shastras. I can't really comment on that. One. Thank you, Maharaj. It was a very nice answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. This is Komodaki Rasi. Yeah, yeah, Komodaki. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Very, very nice class. You nicely we explain everything. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, thank you for the lovely class. And, uh, I have a question in connection to the question asked just uh, now regarding suicide, Guru Maharaj. Uh, the person who commits the suicide, actually their mental condition is so bad and it's not that easy to commit a suicide, basically, for a living human being, you know, although they decide or think about it as well. But when the person is committing, they have got some solid reason behind that. So when they find the life is so difficult to live, and in certain cases, it is very difficult to live in that particular body, what, what should they do? What steps should they take? Become Krishna conscious. Let him take shelter of Krishna. Give him the holy name. Give him a chance. First step is to somehow or other explain to them that there is there is a better life, and you can show them how you can they can experience that better life. Mm. Yeah. Once you somehow or other can uh, somehow indicate that suicide is not the solution. I mean, they have uh, they have these things in uh, in the material world. They call them suicide, suicide hotlines when people want are about to commit suicide. So that you can call and somebody on the other end will answer, and you tell them you want to commit suicide, and then they speak to you in different ways, trying to uh, dissuade you from doing it. But just dissuading people from doing it. It means you have to substitute something in its place. So we teach people that, you know, life has value when it's connected with God, because God is the source of life. And you can find happiness in your relationship with God. So we want to somehow or other indicate that you can, you know, go on with your life. It can get better if you bring God into your life. Now, you might say, well, sometimes people are suffering physically. But you know, mm -hmm. people who are suffering physically, the, the statistics are that very few people who suffer physically commit suicide. It's people who suffer mentally. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Somehow you can tolerate physically. And so either they become suicidal, they become violent, they become alcoholics, they become drug addicts. You know, this is another ways of becoming suicidal by somehow or other just living a, a different life where they think they can somehow forget about all their suffering. But you, you know, it's like the verse, the pandapi napasyati. A person drinks, mistakenly, they drink some poison, and then they reach for some antidote to neutralize the poison. What do they grab? Another bottle, another bottle of poison. So the solution is to bring them to their relationship with Krishna. That's, only, that's the only solution. So Guru Maharaj, not everyone is because that lucky to it. find someone, isn't it, to help them out? No, you know, there was one devotee who set up a suicide hotline also. Just, he had it as a general thing, and people were calling, and he was trying to help them by bringing them to Krishna consciousness. It was a good form of preaching. He set it up 
where people were calling in and then he would just bring them to Krishna. Uh, so yeah, there's attempts by compassionate devotees to somehow help people in different ways. We should do but more of that. The whole that world's committing suicide. <laughs> people are committing suicide simply by being materialistic. That's another form of suicide. Mm, that's true, Maharaj. That's so true, Guru Maharaj. But yeah, like the, the um, Shastra, Shastra, Shastra says, uh, it's called Atma Janaha. Atma Atma Atma. What is it? Atma Atma Janaha or something. Atma Hatya is it? Something, something like that, which means mm. killer of the soul. So people are killing their souls simply under under the name of material life. That is absolutely true, Guru Maharaj. That's so true. Mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj, who was that the devotees who had this suicidal helpline? Oh boy, that's been so long ago. Oh, is there anything any... like that going on? Yeah, I think you might do a little research and see if you can find it. Hmm. Nowadays, you can find anything through the internet, <laughs> or <laughs> even through the even through the devotee channels. Yeah. Okay. I I was traveling and I just happened to meet this person, or hear about this person who was doing it. I think and it was just mm -hmm. something I came across. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for your answer. That's a good help and gives me something, some thoughts now. Yeah. Mm, the idea is if you meet a person like that, always be positive. Because I come across those type of people uh, through work. And I was just thinking how to, how can we help? Yeah, you can start generically with using terminology that is not so much identifying with a particular spiritual movement, but just general principles. Hmm. Spiritual principles, moral principles. They're looking for love. Mm -hmm. they, can, they, they don't have anyone in their life that they can love, nor they can feel love. Show mm -hmm. some kindness. If you show some kindness to them, mm -hmm. and you do it in a caring way, which we, we try to, because we know that the soul is very dear to Krishna. And that mm -hmm. helps them to, to be ready for whatever else you may say to them. Mm. They have to feel like somebody cares for them. Agreed for that. Absolutely. Good point, Guru Maharaj. That's perfectly what I have so I've seen that yet. Yeah. Hare Krishna, thank you, Dipti. Thank you, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. You know, I'm in London now. Can I can I see you, Guru Maharaj? Any chance? Come to the manor. Manor? Okay. Um, How yeah. Well, ah. I, I I'd suggest you come on August first to. To the morning class, Bhagavatam class, August 1st. Okay. And yeah, I'll be there. We'll be giving initiations on that day, August 1st. Oh, okay. At the Haveli. Mm -hmm. Oh, brilliant. Will you be there this Sunday as well, Guru Maharaj? I'm here for a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll come on Sunday. If I can get chance morning Aarti, I will be able to do that yeah mm. okay it'll be so nice to see you thank you so much Krishna. Mm -hmm. this Hare sunday Krishna. This, this sunday is a, is a full day so it might not work oh come at a different time 
Saturday? Hmm? Saturday? Oh, that's even more fuller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Um, any evenings? Uh, no, that won't work. Afternoons um, are good. Afternoons are good. Just good one. I haven't got any holidays. I will uh, try. I will try. <laughs> come on the first of August, then I'll see you then. Yeah, I will come on first. Definitely, definitely, on first. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, it's Tiffany again. Dipti's so lucky. I'm so <laughs> she'll get to see you. Um Come to London. I, I would love to. Um, After the long time, Mataji. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I just I actually there's a question in the chat box that Parima um, posted that I actually had a question about as well. Um, she I'll, she wrote, Hare Krishna Maharaj, what if a devotee commits suicide? And I, and I have happens. that question as well. How are we to look at that? What how, that It's so confusing it's happened. when it happens. It happened. It was happened not long ago, about a year ago, when devotee in New Vrindavan committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I know. And there's been others also. Yeah, it's happened. So how how do we take that? How do we process that? What is you know? Well, the mind can convince you of anything if you allow it. Mind can convince you that doing this is better than what you're doing now. That's why we shouldn't listen to our minds. You have to listen to the words of Guru, the words of Krishna, the words of Shastra, the words of the saints. Listening to the mind can cause us to develop the wrong, wrong ideas and wrong activities. The mind should only be listened to when it reflects the words of the Guru, Krishna, and the saints. If it doesn't reflect any of these, then the mind is simply becoming our enemy. That's all. It says that in the Bhagavad Gita, the mind is the best friend or worst enemy. There's no greater enemy than the, than, than the mind. Rod Maharaj was preaching that to his father. When his father was trying to you know, convince him to become a nice demon. And Prahlad was preaching to him Krishna consciousness. And, and then Harnikashipu said to Prahlad, you're siding with my enemy, Vishnu. Vishnu is my enemy. Prahlad said, my dear father, your only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> We create friends and enemies based on the mind. As Walt Whitman says, uh, the mind is a, a thing in itself and can create heaven out of hell and hell out of heaven. You can be in heaven and feel like you're in hell. You can be in hell and you can be completely aloof from everything about hell. It's all been is consciousness and it's reflected in that way. Really? You have an experience, we have an experience where in one mind is not there. Mind is somewhere else. So wherever you take your mind, you go. Mind takes you, you go. So you have to control the mind and bring it to Krishna, bring it words of and you're always in the best position for advancement and for happiness. If you listen to the mind, it can, you know, there's a whole, you'll call, actually this whole section on uh, 
um, Jed Bart, right at the end, towards the middle of this chapter, no, next chapter, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is just full of verses on the mind. Uh, you'll uh, see, and then you get into, uh, you know, other areas, it just goes on and on and on. This is a really, The question is, does the deceased devotee become a devotee, become a, a ghost, despite the fact that he's chanting? He may have to be. I can't really say that's under the laws of material energy. And the material energy is works in different ways. It takes into account not only what's happening, but what is the person's past. But we can say for sure that uh, if a devotee commits suicide, he may have to go into a ghost body for a little while. And then he realizes when he's there that he made a mistake. He may have to just experience that suffering for a while. But, you know, what I'm saying is just conjecture based on the principle of how Krishna treats his devotees or how he helps his devotees. He always wants us to learn our lesson. It's not like when you're trying to teach someone, you have to teach them to learn a lesson so they don't make the same mistake again. An overprotective parent doesn't allow its child to do anything, and therefore the child never learns. <laughs> we call that hel helicoptering, you know, helicoptering. <laughs> That's the term they use. Uh, we have to experience life, just like sometimes we see, especially in Indian families, it happens mostly. The, 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 the son grows up and he wants to leave home. And, you know, go out and do things. He doesn't want to live with the parents anymore. Parents can't understand why he's leaving. Because he wants to experience life on his own. He doesn't want, he wants to break loose from the bonds of, of uh, you know, parental, uh, you know, jurisdiction. So we have to live life. And learn from uh, okay. uh, it's like... Krishna consciousness, Krishna will, will give you a little slap for your wrong activity. So he'll allow material energy to slap you, but at the same time to help you learn. But it's not like the materialists who get really hit hard with the suffering. The devotee doesn't get the same kind of suffering. But he gets something to teach him. Lalita, Lalita Tangi, you had a question? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Danut Pranams, thank you so much uh, for your, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm still... <laughs> struggling to find a proper adjective for your class so it's always like that it touches the soul thank you so much uh, i just uh, was looking into the 11th chapter that you said about mind and uh, i found this verse so at the end of the chapter the whole chapter is very instructive and there is one more uh, verse i was trying to number, find number 17 is it uh yeah, it's the last verse in the 11th chapter. It's 17, yeah. Uh, it's number 17, yes, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, if you've written that verse, so somebody can read it. Go ahead and read it. Yeah, uh, the uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and will become victorious. Although it is not factual, 
it is very strong it covers the constitutional position of the soul o king please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and of the supreme personality of godhead do this with great care can i read the purport mm -hmm. also more the first line of the purport is really interesting yeah purport that is one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered neglect the mind is always telling us to do this or that therefore we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders gradually the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul it is not that one should obey the orders of the mind shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur used to say that to control the mind one should beat it with shoes many times just after awakening and again before going to sleep in this way one can control the mind this is the instruction of all the shastras if one does not do so one is doomed to follow the dictations of the mind another bona fide process is to abide strictly by the orders of the spiritual master and engage in the lord service then the mind will be automatically controlled shri chaitanya mahaprabhu has instructed shila rupa goswami brahmanda brahmite kona bhagyavan jeeva guru krishna prasade pai bhakti lata beej when one receives the seed of devotional service by the mercy of the guru and krishna the supreme personality of godhead once the real life begins if one abides by the orders of the spiritual master by the grace of krishna he is freed from service to the mind wow mm -hmm. yeah, the by the mind is not a very good master <laughs> something have you ever had this experience near sitting up on a high position somewhere maybe high up on a building or high in some place and you're looking down and the mind tells you jump <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't listen to it but it, you know it has that way of reminding you how you know how much she tries to ruin your life <laughs> offer the sweet offer the sweet yeah so the mind can tell you anything at any time <laughs> it can tell you something about someone one day and can tell you the opposite about the same person the next day it's always changing it's always flickering chanchala himana krishna pramati balabhadra ha it's chanchala so he's flickering and krishna gives the instructions in the bhagavad gita practice to control the mind and detach yourself from sense gratification and that's what paul was basically saying here you can only control the mind by putting the mind under the control of higher knowledge mm -hmm. if we listen to the mind we're in trouble there's no question about that put the spoon there too okay. thank you so much maharaj uh, i had this experience recently we visited the niagara falls from the canada side uh -huh. and uh, surprisingly uh, i mean what you said i i could see that usually in, in places like that where people would be tempted to jump they would put some barricades or you know try to stop people but here it was just very easy to jump and jump down it was like that and i was thinking yeah what you said the same thing it says that uh, i mean yeah it's true that how the mind uncontrolled mind is an enemy yeah it has to be guided by intelligence and intelligence has to be guided by higher knowledge that's the formula for success intelligence guiding the mind in the right direction 
you're chanting your, your, on your beads, your mind is thinking about everything. You tell your mind, shut up. I want to chant the holy name. And the mind is just trying to go somewhere else to satisfy its fantasies. So you, you then you employ the intelligence to pull back the mind and bring it back to the chanting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. I think we can... Maharaj Prasadam is ready. So. Huh? Prasadam is ready? Is, is that, that your, your prasadam is ready, Maharaj? Um, it's out there. It's waiting. <laughs> okay, yeah. So thank you so much for your association. Maybe Nina Mataji, we can conclude. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the beautiful, beautiful class. And thank you so much for the instructions and the reminding us we are not this body, we are the soul. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll see you everyone again in a couple of Thank weeks. Very well, very well. Thank you. We've got an audience darshan now. Okay. <laughs> Balita and Dina Bandu. Hmm. Must be getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs> In Baltimore, it's getting cooler. Well, oh, really? Yeah. It's I just heard. I just heard a report from a devotee in New York today. She says there's big, big fire, wildfires out in California, mm -hmm. and the smoke is going into the air, and it's carrying all the way into New York from oh. California. There was yes, so please. much so that the sky is actually misty. You can't even see the sun. Mm. It's that way in Pennsylvania and Ohio as well. Mm. Yeah, the material world is, you can always expect trouble, difficulty. The whole life in the material world is to fight against the, the difficulties. Yeah, that's all they're doing is fighting against difficulties. Spiritual life means to fight, to develop a condition where we don't have to fight against material. We have to tolerate the material difficulties and just go on with our Krishna consciousness, which is the source of happiness. If the if the bodies plan a picnic and it rains, they can still chant Hare Krishna and be happy. <laughs> but if the non devotees plan a picnic and it rains, the whole day is ruined and everybody's unhappy. We're not dependent on the material energy. Dependent on Krishna. <laughs> Krishna likes that. He likes when devotees are dependent on him. And if he has to create some difficulty in your, in your life to make you dependent on him, he'll do it. That's his mercy. That's his mercy. His mercy. That's, that's secondary. He wants us to do it voluntarily, but because we're, we haven't completely got to that point yet, so he... he and, he encourages us through some difficulties. Tate nu kampa shu shimikshimanam, ujane vav krita vivakam, vidva bahubir vidadana maste jiveti yo mukti padesha daya bhakti. Yeah, very powerful verse. One who accepts all these that come as mercy of the Lord actually. Uh, gets the gets the mercy of the Lord in such a way that they become qualified to return back to the spiritual world. This world is full of suffering. That's all it is. 
even so-called happiness goes on is now another form of suffering. That's all. So the idea is to stay in, stay Krishna conscious. That's all. Become Krishna conscious and stay Krishna. You can push back all the suffering of the material world. Yeah. Yeah. The example is, you know, the material world is compared to an ocean. And on the other side of the ocean is the spiritual world. To cross an ocean is practically impossible. But if the ocean shrinks down to a, the size of a puddle, you can just walk over it. So that's the devotional service. Shrinks this ocean of material existence down to a little watery puddle and we can just cross it easily. No matter what happens, don't give up on Krishna. <laughs> no matter what he does or doesn't do, stay with Krishna. It's always glorious in in either the immediate or in the end. It's always glorious. Okay, I do have a few meetings right after lunch, so I should run. <laughs> oh, so, but kept you waiting for so you. long. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can offer obeisance this to Maharaj and all the small devotees. Pancha Kalpataru, Mr. Kikas, Thank you. 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 Thank